Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. I'm a psychotherapist, teacher, consultant, and most importantly, a wounded healer, living and working in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm your host, Anne Remy. I'm a counseling psychotherapist, yoga teacher, and trauma specialist living in Brighton, UK. On this show, we interview folks in a variety of healing professions, and we discuss the intersectional journey of healing self while caring for others. But we're not just focused on individual healing, but also healing on the collective level, from white supremacy, late-stage capitalism, and the patriarchy. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Ian. How are you feeling? I still have laryngitis. I still have a cough. I also am dealing with an acute broken heart at the moment, so Mm. there's a lot of struggle over here, but also I feel like I have the capacity to know that even though I'm not okay right now, I will be okay, Mm. and that is new. That is very new for me. That feels like a win. Yeah. Not a win that you necessarily want to have to learn the hard way, but yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Mm. How about you? I'm feeling pretty good. I'm excited to talk about today's guest and about my journey with today's episode. Me too. But before I do that, I want to mention how people can support us. So if you want to support our podcast, which we would love you to do, you can buy merch at tinyurl.com slash CWH merch. That's tinyurl.com slash CWH merch. You can also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, please. Please do that. Pretty please. Pretty please. And you can support us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash convos with a wounded healer. Patreon.com slash convos with a wounded healer. And if you're in the States and you sign up with as little as a dollar a month, Sarah's going to send you a gift. And if you're in the UK, I'm going to send you a gift. Yeah. Yeah. So. (sighs) (laughs) Okay. So here's the thing, (laughs) y'all. Cheddar Gorgeous, Dr. Cheddar Gorgeous, is next level intelligent yes. and wise yes. and probably like some next tier level being, yes. to be honest. I think so. And so I asked Cheddar to be on the podcast because I think a lot of what they do as a drag artist and as a basic human, not a basic human being, as a human being, is very important and very healing. And I've been a big fan of Cheddar's for a long time from their work on different television shows and most famously on RuPaul's Drag Race UK. What I was not prepared for was, (laughs) (laughs) despite having seen how smart Cheddar is, right? This is not a secret. Despite having seen this, I was not prepared for how that was going to affect me in our interview. And a little fun fact about me is I am a very intelligent person and I use that to hide behind. Yeah. So my intelligence is absolutely a defense. It is absolutely something. It's a crutch. It is a mask. It is all of those things. And I have sort of relied on being or my perception of being one of the most intelligent and culturally literate people in the room. Yep. And then here comes Cheddar Gorgeous. Sauntering in. <laughs> Sauntering in. And oh my God, if I just was not sitting there panicking, this interview pulled up all of the little parts of me that were going, you're not smart enough. Yeah. You're not as smart as the person in front of you. You can't keep up, which then kind of translated into you're still new at this job. You're not doing a good job. You're not good enough. And I like spiraled out. And I swear after we finished recording, I had sweat through my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just closed my laptop and I was like, I need to go for a run. Mm. So it was like this energy that was just coursing through my body that I had to get out. And As I was running, I was like, what is going on for me? And I had to process this. Mm. And I was like, this is my little kid self. I see where you're coming from. I understand why you're triggered at this moment. I know what's going on. Girl, I see you. Let's pause. Let's take care of you, you know, as I was running. 
And then I messaged you and said, I don't know about this one. Like, Cheddar was incredible. I don't know that I was. Mm. And I was terrified to listen to it until today because I had to listen to it. <laughs> well, what, what did I say back to you? You said that it was a lot better than I thought it was and that I had done a good job and you were like dying over Cheddar. This um, was one of my favorite interviews of all time. Yeah, right. Okay, so I listened back to it and I was like bracing for impact as I listened back to it, prepared to like tear myself apart. And I was like, if I were my own client, what would I say to myself? And I would say, you're supposed to be kind and compassionate to yourself. So let's just bring that in as I listen to it. And then I'm listening to it and I'm like, hold on. That was a really good thing I just said. Oh, that actually wasn't. Oh, okay. And then I said something that I had completely forgot I said. And I was like, yeah, that was so good. Yeah. So the moral of the story here is that you're about to listen to something that I am still pretty uncomfortable with everybody listening to because I'm still landing into the fact that it was not as shit as that very old part of me wants me to think it was. And that is a similar experience that I had to when I did my first podcast interview with Andrea on The Creative mm -hmm. Imposter. And she didn't publish it for like six months. And so I assumed that I sounded like an idiot, that I was stupid, and that nobody wanted to hear what I had to say. And when she published it, I listened to it, and it felt like I was reparenting myself. It felt like I was loving mm -hmm. myself as as a younger version of me. Yeah. And I I was for the I think the first time filled with an authentic pride that wasn't afraid of being punished for being mm. proud of myself. I think that's so great. And for me, the experience of being like feeling like, oh, that was really shit is so foreign and so old yeah. because it's something I've worked really hard to not struggle with Yeah, that it really did just kind of smack me upside the head. So that being said, that's not what I want anyone to be focusing on while they're listening to this episode because I want everyone to just be listening to how just phenomenal Cheddar is. And I want the audience because I, I re-listened to it. I listened to it the first time, felt like I had been taken to church in the best way and also given a lecture in the best way. And I listened to it again and I want... I want people to tune into like, it's not just the words that Cheddar is saying, but Cheddar occupies a more expansive way of being in this world than most of mm -hmm. us do. And that is the, that's the offering that I think Cheddar brings is an invitation for all of us to expand into more of who we are as spiritual beings. Even though you guys didn't talk about spirituality at all, that was a very spiritual conversation mm. for me. I'd be mm. curious what Cheddar thinks about that reflection, but that's, that's what I want listeners to really allow themselves, if you can, allow yourself to take that in, in its totality. Mm. Um, and Cheddar, if you're listening, we'd love to have you back. Oh, I am <laughs> dying to meet Cheddar now. And Cheddar's laugh. So good. I rarely meet someone whose laugh is better than mine, but that I think their laugh is better than mine. It's real good. Yeah. Real good. Yeah. So Cheddar Gorgeous, aka Dr. Michael Atkins, is an academic, a drag performer, and visual artist based in Manchester. Their body of work stretches across a broad spectrum of arenas. The alien deity is most well known as the star of Channel 4's Drag SOS, as well as BBC's RuPaul's Drag Race UK. However, their work was born from their roots in underground queer club culture, academia, and activism. And Cheddar's going to touch on all of that. So have a listen. Let us know what you think. And here's Cheddar. Hello, therapists. Does the word finance make you want to run and hide? We get it. We didn't learn this stuff in school. So join business consultant Aggie Shajinsky and me for a live interactive workshop designed specifically for therapist business owners. Gain valuable insights into financial literacy and begin to build confidence in your business management skills. This fun and engaging workshop will equip you with essential tools to understand the numbers and address the emotions surrounding your business finances while staying connected to anti-capitalist values. 
Don't miss this opportunity to enhance your financial knowledge and improve your practice. Tuesday, October 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. Central Time on Zoom. Registration is donation-based, and 100% of donations will go directly to Sista Afia Community Care in Chicago. To register, visit tinyurl.com slash therapist finance. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash therapist finance. Cheddar Gorgeous, welcome to Conversations with the Wounded Healer. Hello there. It's Hi. a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited you're here. Well, if you'd like you to reduce your expectations, I promise you will not be disappointed. Ah, uh, no. I'm going to keep my expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm still going to be excited. It's I'm American. You can't can't <laughs> tone down the excitement. Oh, we can't get we can't get rid of that plucky enthusiasm no, and we would never we want sure to. Cannot. Yes, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, I, um, it's me, Cheddar Gorgeous. I'm uh, renowned as a drag artist. Did you see that? I think it's potentially risky saying that you're renowned as something because actually people may have no idea that that's what I do. But I'm a drag artist and self-professed cultural icon in an ironic, playful way. And I live and work in Manchester. I love that. And you can be a self-professed whatever you want. And I think, oh, thank I think you. you are renowned as a drag artist. Oh, stop That's, it. I, that's stop how it, I found you. out about you. Infamous, Inf- infamous, some, may say. Uh, some would say. So, for our American listeners, I first found out about Cheddar through a show called Drag SOS, which is, is it okay to say that it's We're Here before We're Here was here? Yes, uh, I refer to it as We Were Here First. <laughs> but said with love, I have all the time in the world for the wonderful uh, We're Here girls. But yeah, so it was. It's the same concept essentially. So a group of drag queens on a bus. Although we didn't have a bus each, we only had one bus because it's England, <laughs> and you always have to set your sights a little bit lower <laughs> when in England. You don't want to be too showy. Not a bus each. No, we'll save on the petrol. We'll get everyone on the same bus, and we'll create a, a more generic decoration for that bus. So it's the same concept though. We traveled around small mm. towns and used drag as a way of allowing people to explore the sense of their self, connect with the communities yeah. around them and generally, hopefully make life a little bit better. And make your audience cry because that's, I well, sobbed through every episode. That has always been my aspiration to be the drag queen that makes people <laughs> cry. I just thought, Laughing and cheering, it's so done before. Let's get Let's tears get in the house. Sobbing. That's what people need more of. Yes, absolutely. I mean, but it was it was sobbing through just amazing emotional moments and connections that you were making with some of the people you were working with, but with the the connections that the people you were working with were making with each other and with their communities. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think drag in its foundation for me is I describe it as being an uh, a relationship art. So you can talk about drag as involving many different kinds of art forms and performance forms, lip sync, singing. Often people really struggle to hone down exactly what drag is about. And for me, it's very much the collaging of makeup, costume and different kinds of performance in order to create living spectacles. And the key there is the way that those spectacles live. And those spectacles live in the way that people form relationships with them. So as such, you are enmeshed within, whether you're doing it online or whether you're doing it in a bar, drag involves the formation of connections. So for me, one of the big interests in drag was to, to think about how we use that beyond the stage, because a lot of drag takes place off the stage. The stage is a great way to connect with people, but also a lot of drag happens up the bar in conversations. Just by being noticed on the street, if you're doing it there, you are intimately connected with all of those who regard you. And in its very foundation, it's not about a particular performance form or theatrical form. It's very much about the creation of those connections for me i love that there's so okay so i went deep early didn't you i sure i'm sorry did. about and that no 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 apologies necessary. never be sorry <laughs> never be sorry i should have asked no. permission though <laughs> you know so drag to you is about creating connections to what end all art is and and to what end is very much down to the individual artist isn't it really and so we and why I, I sometimes get a little bit bothered with the way that drag is lauded as either one particular thing or having one particular purpose and in many ways that 
that both does a disservice to it as an art form, but it also elevates it a little bit. Because let's be honest, not all drag has good intentions. Some drag is just done to make a lot of money and to get free drinks at the bar. And, you know, I've certainly used drag to those ends as well. Sure. But I, th- I, th- I think all art can be... Uh, like anything, you know what I mean? Like nuclear power, uh, <laughs> like like anything that humans do, it can be used for good and for ill ends. So for me, the ends, I like to, I said one of those classic, really stereotypical things, I'd like to think that I leave the world better than how I found it, which feels like an impossible task. But I think that's that's for me about where I like to find a sense of meaning and purpose in life, right? So one of the things I really struggled with committing to be a drag artist, so I trained as a social worker and then was an academic. And it's a very, I'm very, I'm a very serious person. A very, very serious person. Well, you're a doctor, are you not? I'm a you doctor. A... I'm a doctor for heaven's sake. I shouldn't be <laughs> dressing up in silly clothing and having a nice time. And so for me, one of the one of the the ways I reconciled that was to think about how I could use drag to those ends, whether it be through community work or whether it be through telling interesting stories, either about mm. myself or about my understanding of the world. And so a lot of the drag that I do, and I, I describe the performances I do as being very narrative led. I think about what the story is I'm telling with that mm. performance. And I've done performances that have, I mean, you know, I've done, I've done simple I'm having a lovely time Barbie style numbers. Mm -hmm. But then I've also done numbers about landmines in Afghanistan. And I've done numbers about Eileen Wurinos. And I've done numbers that that try and tell complex stories and create empathy in places that you don't expect to find it. And so and I love doing that in a nightclub. That was where I started Mm. doing drag was we would do these kind of strange performances that only we really cared about until people started coming along. Was your specific brand of narrating and creating empathy, was that well received in nightclubs? Absolutely. I love that. Everyone's drunk. (laughs) 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 But it was a different way. Like, I've been doing drag for quite a time. So I was doing drag in the UK before it became really, really Mm -hmm. popularized over here. So you could kind of, I mean, you didn't earn any money, but you could kind of get away with doing whatever you wanted. And there was definitely a, a niche group of people who were interested and hungry for seeing something that challenged them, whether they were drunk or not. And the nightclub was in its best points, not always, but in its best points, the nightclub is a space that's on the fringes that allows often people who are living lives on the fringes an opportunity to tell their stories, which is why drag has always been so popular in nightclubs and cabarets and with queer people, right? Because it's a form of storytelling Mm -hmm. that's considered lowbrow, but that we were able to have our lives represented to us and and spoke back to us. Storytelling is foundational, I think, to community and to humans. We we narrativize everything. We narrativize our relationships with each other and we narrativize a sense of self. You know, it's a bit like have you ever seen Westworld? That one about the, the robots. Oh, no, because sci fi and robots are not my genre. No? no. Oh well, I'm telling you, you would be into it psychologically very interesting so i've i i but i can't get past the robots thing it's like anything that has zombies or robots or dragons it's but all of those things are talking about people really they're not talking about robots and dragons and and zombies so yes and i love what you're saying about stories and narratives and i prefer my stories and narratives that don't involve robots yeah. yeah. And like, so I, my, one of my, one of my arts mentors is a guy called Baron Story. He's an American artist and he, he's an absolutely profound American artist. What a great name. What a great name, yeah. right? Baron Story. And it's story spelled with an E-Y. So, you know, it's, it's even nicer in some respects. But Baron used to say to me he hated science fiction because he preferred stories to be told about real people. Mm. And so his point was, well, why do you need the robots? Why do you need the zombies? And I think sometimes people find it less believable when it's real people. So if you if you Mm. have and particularly when you're talking about the invisible forces that may oppress us or limit us or structure our lives, we find it hard to believe we like to imagine things as a monster. Mm-hmm. or as a robot or as a as a structured force that's coming down on us. So in many ways, that extra layer of disbelief that science fiction and fantasy provides allows us to reflect upon our own world. Have you, have you seen the series Black Mirror? Yeah, oh, yeah. So Black Mirror is the classic mm-hmm. example of that, right? It, it delivers back to us the life as we experience it now, 
but slightly heightened and made. And, and it's only when you look at it and you go, oh, God, that's actually what things are like now. There's an element of truth yeah. in there, but it's made extreme. And we make that extreme point not to say that this is how things are, but to highlight that particular element of the world that we see. So as you were saying that, I think I just realized why I struggle so much with fantasy and science fiction, mm. because I need mm. my villains to be something I can negotiate with and I can't negotiate with uh, a robot. Oh, you can. But you can negotiate with a robot and particularly in, in like new, if you look at something like Westworld, yeah. which is about robots that have become so like humans, mm. it's that question of how do you define what is human? And they have, it, it's basically a story of their civil rights in, in certain extents, but we're not really talking about robots. We're talking about, so the robots in Westworld, they're in a theme park and they're living set patterns Every single day, they repeat the same day over and over again. They get reset mm. at the end of the day or at the end of the week, depending on what their loop is. And in many ways, it's talking about the repetitions that we experience in our own lives mm. and the way that we are trapped into patterns of behavior and how we liberate ourselves from those patterns of behavior. So the villain is not a person to negotiate with in that sense. The villain is the ways that we restrict our own existence and the forces by which those conditions are created. But you can't negotiate with the, those things either. And they're the really real things. You don't think you can negotiate with that? With I, Can you negotiate with a set of circumstances that encourage you into a pattern of life that you may feel is detrimental to you? I don't think you can negotiate with it as an actor. Mm. I think that you can identify things that you can shift and change. Mm -hmm. And you can find elements of that which you can negotiate with or gatekeepers or whatever that, that might be creating those conditions. We've gone very meta, very, very quickly, very big. That's all right. I'm, I'm down with it as well. One of the things we talk about a lot on this podcast is the systematic oppressive forces like capitalism, racism, all that. <laughs> yeah. All the isms. Yeah. And I hear what you're saying when we're, you know, you can't negotiate with capitalism. And I think for me, maybe mm. one of the reasons I struggle with sort of fantasy-like mm. things is I need to feel like I can negotiate. At some point, there has to be a human mm. that I can go, but look, can't you just see that this is horrible? And then the CEO gives in and all of the the writers get what they're asking for and the actors get what yeah. they're asking for. But it's bigger yeah. than that, isn't it, right? And so you can't negotiate with capitalism, but you can draw a line of where you feel comfortable, but that's, and you also, you can call for regulation, mm. which I think is is one of those things. I think we're very binary with the way that we, with the things that we criticize. And I think that can be said along all lines, along lines of transphobia, mm -hmm. homophobia, racism, and anti-capitalism. It's this way or mm -hmm. this way. And I think with capitalism, I always look at it, I'd, I'd never describe myself as an anti-capitalist. And that's because the, the systems that are presented in opposition to capitalism have rarely worked out as well. And in, in some respects, I think we see that the system may not be the problem here. There's another fallibility that we also have to consider, and that's about humans and their corruptibility. But you can regulate. And so I always think of pushing forward with the idea of calling for more regulation and fairer regulation of what is proving to be an existing stable system than potentially embracing a system that has very similar flaws. So if you look at the way that more extensively socialist systems that are socialist led have been enacted in the world, they often don't present all the golden mm -hmm. solutions because they're subject to the same level of corruption as, as capitalism is. So, yeah, but that's yeah, getting complex again and big. Out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Get back in your box, Cheddar. Let's talk about putting dresses no, on. No, because I think what what you said, you said something about how the, you didn't say the solution is in the non-binary, but the... Complexity. The complexity. The solution is, is complex. The solution is complex in an embracing all those gray areas in between. And I mm. think that you as a human, so before we started recording and I asked you what pronouns... You preferred, well, what did you say to me? What was your, what is your response uh, to that? I said, I'll, I'll accept all of them. I'll use different ones in different contexts. Mm. So I'm very conscious that there's a huge amount of pressure on people to identify in highly specific ways. And I think that we've become very obsessed with creating our places within existing structures mm -hmm. of power. 
right? So I understand why people, and I think I always think about it in terms of sexuality, you know, the idea of identifying as gay, bi, or, you know, pan, or whatever these different terminologies we might put up. These are all about providing space and safety mm-hmm. for people. So I understand why people require those categories. But in, in and the pronouns is exactly mm-hmm. the same thing, you know, encouraging a particular way of speaking about yourself to enforce a notion of who you are. The thing I, <laughs> the thing I would say about pronoun uses and securing pronoun use, we all know that you can have the correct pronoun used or the your preferable pronoun used and it can still be a microaggression. Mm-hmm. So, the you know, anybody who's experienced she, oh, she did, mm. did she? Or they, oh, they did, did, oh, did they? In inverted commas. Like, so I think we get very hung up on those words and rather than actually dealing with the real complexities that we might want to deal with, which is about access to medical care and access to appropriate spaces for you and how you deal with the the conflicts around that to ensure that what you require isn't harming somebody else and vice versa, right? So how do we get into really negotiating those things? But we live in a world that demands those things of us, that there's a, a certain soft tyranny that calls for us to constantly identify in particular ways. That doesn't always reflect the way humans change and grow and experience reality. And that answer, I think, speaks to zoom back out to exactly what you're saying, right? Mm. The solutions are in the complex answers, which you just gave, right? A quote unquote simple question, what are your pronouns, opens up this amazing... Mm. We're living in a world in which the problems that are presented to us by a very particular form of media are not actually the things that are impacting upon people's life all the time. And we are sold... And we are we are used in that selling. And I'm talking specifically here about the relationship between media and new mm-hmm. media, social media, politics and economy. Right. So you have this kind of deathly triangle, which is leading the debate and encouraging us to debate. Mm. So rather than actually tackling the complexities of people's lives and addressing what they need, we are having our attention sold as ad space. Mm. And the byproduct of that is to create a polarizing argument that we all become obsessed with. And of course, never actually end up dealing with how to make a better Mm. world. I I really worry that we're kind of trapped a little bit when it comes to debating anything nowadays. Trapped meaning? The very way that we encourage to Mm -hmm. debate and think through issues and the, hang on, let me think of the word that I want to use the format Mm -hmm. and the platforms through which debate and discussion of these things happens are such that you can't help but make the situation worse. Yeah, okay. And I think if we look at activism now, if we look at even like climate change activism, it's no longer about evidence and about these conversations taking place in a productive way. And you can look at this from the micro things that are between to human beings to, you know, the big issues like climate change and the culture war and all of this sort of stuff. They're taking place in a forum where the intention is to make us fall out and argue more and make us more divided. And that's because our argument and our division sells more, creates more clickbait. So I worried that our very, our energy, if you like, is caught and is trapped in that. We're sold these ways of communicating with one another and the very the human relationships are very, very commodified now in the way that they are enacted through privately owned social media platforms. We're spending more of our time debating in there than anywhere else. And that's, I agree with you 100%. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons that I find you so refreshing is because when, when I see you having these discussions with people who may not agree with you or who aren't used to your specific style of art you lead with empathy you lead with kindness <laughs> and i think that rather than trying to shame somebody into change offering somebody a different perspective while trying to understand their perspective is a better inroad to creating change rather than everybody just fighting on social media well that's a that probably comes from a benazir bhutto quote right so benazir bhutto the former prime minister of pakistan I always remember, I can't remember the exact wording, but she said that she loved her enemies. 
She said, I love my enemies and I want to talk to my enemies. And she said, because I want to convince my enemies that I'm right. Right. And it's it's a debating tactic. It's about going, well, this is how I view the world. And I want to be able to engage with them. I want to be able to convince them that actually the thoughts and the ideas that I think are good, they should find good, too. So I, I think that's a great way to go into debates, but also being willing to listen, mm -hmm. you know, and actually have your mind changed. And that's hard because nowadays you're almost expected to choose a polar position mm -hmm. and that's who you are. And there is no room for compromise. I am right. You are wrong. You are are the fascist right and i actually don't think that's an incredibly useful way for anyone to win a debate mm. by not having it you know I, i think you have to be able to be willing to enter into a dialogue and convince the other person and if you yeah sure there are forces that slant those conversations mm -hmm. unfairly You know, and I think if you look at the idea of white privilege and white supremacy, mm -hmm. that's a classic example. There are some conversations that are slanted unfairly and that you have to push extra hard and, and tilt in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to be willing to have a debate. We have to be willing to put our point across. And that's hard, I think, particularly for queer mm. people, because it means yet again our existences and the things that we find and experience as innate about ourselves that do nobody else any mm -hmm. wrong, you know? And I think this is the key thing. They do nobody else any wrong. We're expected to justify them. I think on a broader point, linking back into that, that kind of tyranny of the way we mm -hmm. identify, I think sometimes we seek the voices that say, we seek the voices that say it's not your fault when we consider what's different mm. about ourselves. Or even if we're thinking about mental health, we or mental difference or neurodiversity mm -hmm. and all that stuff we seek a voice that says it's not your fault you were born that mm -hmm. way and i think we should seek more the voice that says you didn't do anything wrong and there's nothing wrong with the way that you are oh i love that and that that's not a voice that says you're born any one particular way or another it's about looking at your life and going there's nothing wrong with what you were doing so you don't need a, a larger identity driven you don't need an an excuse or exactly explanation a, of why yeah. you are the way you are well it opened that that point of view opens out a whole world of possibility right. doesn't it if there is nothing wrong with the way that you are unless you're a dick then you know unless you're a dick <laughs> but <laughs> if there's nothing wrong with the way you are doesn't that give you the freedom To say, okay, if I don't have to justify myself or if I don't have to spend time proving that I'm correct or that I'm, you know, yeah. whatever, what yeah. else could I be putting my energy towards? Or exactly. if I'm, if it's not wrong for me to be a loud human being, then, mm. oh, what else can I do with my voice? Who, who can yeah. I help who, who doesn't have the same yeah. volume that I do? Absolutely, which is what, how a lot of the time with drag I've ended up, because I, I have a particularly privileged position in drag, both in terms of the kind of the work that mm. I've done, but also I, I got away with a lot when it came to being a drag performer in terms of I was able to pretty much do whatever I wanted. I, I, I started doing drag at a particularly interesting cusp where more gender fluid drag was appreciated mm. and actually the thing that made me different was kind of celebrated. So if, I think if I'd have come five years earlier, no one would have booked me for anything, whereas I kind of got away with being in a particularly good moment. So one of the things I'm really interested in is how we take that form of storytelling, mm -hmm. which is kind of innately queer, it's on the outside, it's that mm. which is excessive, Um, which is how I think of the term queer. I don't try to bound queerness by a sense of gender or sexuality. Mm. I think it's about thinking about what exists outside of what is deemed normative. Mm. So how do we use that queering storytelling to amplify other issues? You know, it's what, how I've done stuff around climate mm -hmm. change. I've done stuff around women's rights. You know, so we, we did a big march around in 2017 about the Donald Trump visit to the UK. You know, there's lots of different ways that you can use that particular form of spectacle to talk about all sorts of things. What does that do for you as an individual being amplifying other stories? What does that do for you? Yeah, I, th I think, do you know what I'm going to, I'm like, I'm, I am figuring out the balanced and honest way to put that mm. across because doing stuff for other people generally makes you feel mm -hmm. good. That's what I found. It makes me mm. feel good. And it makes you feel good on other levels. You get kind of kudos for it. 
Mm -hmm. You know, you get given appreciation for showing appreciation for others. It's kind of it's like a real human thing. It's yeah, a good human、sure. thing. We shouldn't be ashamed or worried about that. We shouldn't think that because it's not some weird, pure, altruistic act that somehow it it lacks value. So I think we're built to work in communities. We're、yeah. built to want to help each other out psychologically.、Absolutely. Yeah, we get reward for it. Yeah, and those rewards come in multiple forms. They come in the form of respect from、mm -hmm. other people. People then willing. The people are very willing to listen to me, which are on about myself as well.、Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a mutual、yeah. thing. I shout about somebody else; they're quite happy to shout about、mm. me. You know, there's a, a mutuality to that, and I think I work with that. <laughs> the brutal, the brutal honest truth is, I think I've watched a lot of apocalyptic dramas in、uh -huh. my life. I've, you know, I've seen a lot of like fantastical situations, and I always think, survivability-wise, you want as many people on your side as possible. That's, I mean, right, and it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a. Wrong thing to. to It's to, not, not a wrong, wrong thing.、Motivation. Like I never know when I'm gonna need like Donna from the local corner shop. When I'm gonna need her help, you never really know who you're talking to in this world. And I absolutely want as many people on my side. And as a result, I have to be on other people's side too. Right. That's how the that's how the contract should work.、Right? I love that. It's a it's a mutually beneficial life and apocalypse strategy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thinking of starting your own private practice? Join me for a two-day in-person training, providing what you need to start your own practice on November ninth and tenth in Chicago. The thought of running your own practice can be scary for some, but with a few expert tips, it can be a breeze. This NASW course will provide an overview of what you need to start and maintain a private practice. It will be an action-packed two days where you'll learn the business 101s, build your brand, and create a marketing plan. Participants will leave the course with sample forms, actionable next steps to build a thriving business, and 12 CEUs. The cost is $159 for NASW members and $199 for non-members. Visit tinyurl.com/nasw-private-practice to register. That's tinyurl.com/nasw-private-practice. I have a friend who asks very good questions, and one of the questions that, and he asks them kind of at random times, and and we were love that at dinner, and he said, "What is one thing that, because of your job, you know that most people don't know?" And I thought that was such a good question, and I am going to pose it to you in a minute because I've I've just、yeah. kind of thrown it out there, but yeah, as I've posed it to other people, and as we kind of went around the table that night,、mm. we learned a lot more about each other and a lot about our apocalypse、mm. survival. <laughs> Strangely、mm. enough, like what kind of knowledge do you have that no one else knows that you've got? I think on a very implicit level, like really ingrained, because、mm. I think people know this, but they don't really know it. Attractiveness is totally constructed. Yeah, a total, complete, and utter construction.、Mm. And that's because as a drag performer, you you get these forms of appreciation. So I can, but to be fair, I get it whether I'm dressed as an octopus person or whether I'm dressed as like a beautiful, beautiful lady,、mm -hmm. you know. So you get a, a certain kind of level of regard, and if you you realise that when you go out and say I look really glam,、mm -hmm. and I'll go out and I know I look really、mm -hmm. glam, and you get people saying to you, "Oh my God, you're beautiful," and you know you always go, "Thank you, that's so lovely." But I also know that took two and a half hours in a mirror,、yeah. right? You learn that all that stuff. Is construction.、Mm. It's about time and effort and putting that in. And as a result, for me, I learned to let go of it. So I'm very scruffy on a day-to-day、mm. -day basis. And it's one of the really great things about drag is that you learn that being beautiful is just about effort, right? It's about time and effort. And hopefully, I mean, I I always women. It's frequently you, you get women in clubs, particularly women. Who will come up to you and they go, "Oh, I wish I could do my makeup as well as you," and it's like you don't because you'd look like this all the time, and actually that's a hard <laughs> place to exist in because it's heightened,、yeah. right? They're pinnacle experiences, and I think the real beauty of drag and the real joy of drag is to take the makeup off, and so you learn that value of not making any effort in your appearance,、mm. and you have to get very used to looking at your own face. So you, if you spend two hours in a mirror getting ready. You get very used to figuring out how your face works and looking at your face and getting comfortable with your face. If you're doing、mm -hmm. it right, 
You know, if you're not always just trying to use it as a mask to cover something up, you also get very comfortable with looking a mess. Because if you're working a club and you 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 got into makeup at 9 p.m. and you're leaving the club at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., like you don't look the right. same. And so drag taught me to be able to feel comfortable in my appearance. So this is it's not necessarily something, you know, that other people don't know, but it's a sense of comfort Mm. that I think other people don't have in their own skin. And I think what you just said, I can see the way that you are with others. I mean, and this is from afar, I don't know you personally, right? But in the way that I have experienced you on your socials and in the on Drag SOS and in the way that you've championed other drag performers, the sense that I get is that it's gone beyond just outer beauty and that there's this I wonder if there's a sense of sort of inner beauty or inner I don't know what what the word we want for that is but but there seems to be a sense of inner something that you power inner power I love that power and let's let's figure out what beauty is really about right and a lot of the time for for women and again whoever feels Mm. comfortable in that particular category beauty is about amplifying Mm. is about a certain level even though it can cause danger creating a sense of safety Mm -hmm. through your spectacle making people like you building those relationships getting that promotion just being able to exist on a day-to-day basis without somebody looking at you funny in Mm -hmm. the queue and so it's it's hard horrible to say but i think beauty and glamour has that power because women are starting often at such a disadvantage in mm. our world that they are expected to do this beauty work on a day-to-day basis and they're seen as weirdos if they mm-hmm. don't <laughs> it is ironic because men are seen as weirdos when they do although less and less increasingly these days drag has always been about power for me and it's about how to how to create a more powerful version of yourself that can say and do the things that you thought you couldn't. And there's a transfer, there's a leakage, which isn't the nicest word for it, but to the feeling that you get in drag and how you can pull that into your Mm. day-to-day life out of drag. And that's something that's very performative in a Butlerian sense, not in a, I'm I'm going really, really intensely now, performative in a Butlerian sense. And by that, I don't mean I'm saying it's a performance, it's a facade, it's fake, right? Mm. And absolutely, it sometimes does begin that way. But Butler, who was a famous gender theorist for people who aren't necessarily familiar with it. I am not, so I'm really glad you explained that. Well, they were one of the most renowned gender theorists Mm -hmm. writing in the 80s and 90s. And for me, they, they're they still really, really insightful. But they speak about, let me explain performativity to you, in the ways that you act and are and the way that you walk and the way that you talk and the way the ways that you think to a certain extent, they come to constitute a sense of who you are, mm. right? And so those, and those things can be a mix of, things that you learn as a very small child of how and then but was speaking specifically about gender so how you learn as a, as a girl to mm-hmm. walk and talk and present yourself in a particular way they come to constitute a sense of who you are and now if we think about that in terms of drag drag encourages you to be this ultra confident version of mm-hmm. yourself you you become this larger than life spectacle you make the decision to make yourself stand mm. out and you receive a lot of regard for it People give you a lot of love and a lot of praise. Sometimes they give you hate. Sometimes they spit at you Mm -hmm. in the street, right? But you are consciously taking that decision to be larger Mm -hmm. than life and to embrace a more confident version of yourself. Now, if you do that for long enough, that sense of confidence, that way of walking in the world comes to constitute, in a way, who you are as well. I mean, it can be dangerous because also... Being that larger than life person can also be a lot to deal mm. with. So that's why some drag queens aren't always the nicest people to be around because they're intense, they're mm. heightened. But I think if you can allow that confidence to bleed into your life in the right measure, it enables you to to do a hell of a lot that you thought maybe you couldn't do. Which is why it was powerful on the show, right? Because you, they have this moment. They have this mm. little moment where they're on stage and they're loved and they know that they can do that. And if they think, if you, in a, a very simple way, if you think, oh, well, I could do it on that day, 
maybe I could do it on a regular day. Maybe I can be confident. And that's it. You know, as you were talking about power, I thought about mm. what you do when you share your drag, share your art, um, help others enter into that is you're sharing power. And I'm curious how you feel about the term healer mm. or healing in regards to, to that. Healing. If I think about healing, I go to magic because I'm a Dungeons and Dragons okay. fan. <laughs> My brother proposed to his wife through a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Uh, you know, I'm down with it. So I, I like the idea of magic. I think healing can come in so many mm. forms. And too often we think of it as a formalized process, mm -hmm. uh, as something that's about an expert imparting a treatment mm -hmm. that then creates a profound change. And I don't think healing, real lasting healing, often takes place in that way, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's more about finding a way of being that encourages good growth mm. and repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating until you've laid a foundation, a rhythm that is more positive in your life. Mm. And I think drag can be pretty good at at helping you to do that. But that's not to say not always, mm -hmm. because also that power, that portal that it opens, and it is power mm -hmm. and it's powerful. It's a powerful form of social magic that you're engaging in. Mm. And that always comes with risk, right? Because when we, our brains are designed to enjoy those heightened moments. And if mm -hmm. you can't let go of them, I mean, I don't know whether you've got any performance friends who are in performance, like it's a roller mm -hmm. coaster. It's like, it's like a class A drug without any substances. My first major was musical theater. So, right. <laughs> so you know, you know the come down, yes. right? You know the come yeah. down and you know the feeling of yeah. needing it as well oh, right yeah. so it has to be balanced out with other things so if we're thinking as drag as a form of mm. healing i would say it's great as long as you've got someone who can guide you and help you manage it and keep your keep your drag monster in check because we've all got one and is that something that a drag family supports you with absolutely yeah Oh, yeah, mine definitely keeps me anchored. Could you, <laughs> could you tell us? <laughs> oh, they don't think of me as famous at all. They're, honestly, they they are like, they'll probably they'll just come in and just throw insults at me. Sometimes they open the door and just throw an insult in, obviously given with love. Well, isn't that the British way as well? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, so we couldn't possibly give each other a compliment and mean it. Everything has to be veiled. Could you talk a little bit about a drag family, the drag family, and and yours? Yeah, Tell us about sure. your drag so, family. Yeah, so drag drag families are a little bit of a mix of mentoring, a little bit of a mix of friendship, and a little bit of a mix of of a professional mm -hmm. relationship. And I think sometimes people try to put it across as play families. For some people, absolutely, mm. like yeah, sure, they like they don't have that deeper layer of connection to them. But if you're if you're a professional, your drag family ends up having, and, and if we're going to real simplified terms, the the idea of your sisters, your drag mum, so the person who might have introduced mm. you to drag. Often you find drag queens and kings deploying familial terminology in order to describe the kind of strength of the bond that they feel for the drag queens and kings in close proximity to them. So brother, sister, other, mom and dad and mm. all of that sort of stuff are deployed in that way. And I suppose for me, it's about adding an additional layer of gravitas to a relationship that I find important in mm -hmm. my life. But of course, you have to concede that they also have practical implications. So actually your drag family often help you get work. Mm. So there is a real foundational thing there that can be really helpful for you and quite imperative for you if, if that's what you want to do. But drag's a little bit more than a job, mm. I think, for a lot of people. It does play into your identity. It does play into your life. You know, I think more people know me now as Cheddar than ever knew me as mm. Michael. And they they think of that side of me as the primary person that I am, which I'm, I'm very happy and comfortable with, even if I do need those people in my life who recognize the other side of me too. My drag family are able to recognize both mm -hmm. sides of me. Yeah, and obviously it comes from an, an older idea of the, the notion of queer mm -hmm. family. 
which if we think in an American context is quite different from a British context. So the very idea of, an, of drag family comes from a very American idea of queer families, which were often the result of the the mass migration of queer young people who'd been kicked out in in mm-hmm. small towns across America and ended up going to places like San Francisco and New York because they were seen as the places that people like them could mm-hmm. survive and actually have a, a life where they'd be able to live the way that they wanted to live. And so you ended in the in the States, you had areas like the East Village yeah. in New York. So along the piers of the East Village in New York where a lot of kids were sex working, but also the rent was very cheap. So you ended up with queer people living in households together mm. and looking out for one another. And those bonds could be totally social and platonic or there there might have been a mix of social sexual bonds with lovers, you know, taking mm-hmm. in other people. And it became a kind of strategy of survival, the notion of families that we choose. And whilst I think that notion of survival has diminished a little i think we're seeing a return to the need for those kinds of bonds and don't get me wrong just like just like any bond you know they're they're subject to change and growth and sometimes families drift apart and sometimes families fall out with one another and this is the other thing that's that's often kind of railed against the notion of drag families and queer families is that somehow the bonds aren't as strong or as mm. real and i think for many of those people there though who've needed those bonds who have had to lose connections with family because of their mm-hmm. queerness those bonds are actually stronger than familial connections in fact the very existence of the notion of a queer family is testament to the fact that blood bonds are perhaps not as foundational mm-hmm. as we like to think that they are and particularly when it comes to the idea of abuse and being treated poorly by blood relatives yeah i i actually found myself getting angry as you were talking about okay. the idea of people thinking that that queer families and drag families are not as powerful or important or as legitimate because it's one thing to be a family just because you were born with the same DNA, but it's another thing to opt in and to choose people and say, I am now invested in you Mm. and I am trusting you to be invested in me. Yeah. And we are doing this together. And Absolutely. there's something about opting into that that is so powerful. Absolutely. I think that the way I do drag family is not the way everybody does. And I think there's particularly with the popularization of drag, it is sometimes seen solely mm-hmm. as play. And people opt in without really understanding mm, the implications of okay. what they've opted in for. I was very clear with my drag kids. I was like, I want you to understand that if we're doing this, like if we're going to use this terminology, it does mean something mm. to me. It has a... You know, it has a, a potency for me that I want I want to treat with respect and we need to be clear. And sometimes that hasn't always mm-hmm. worked out, right? But there's been that line of negotiation. There's been that mm-hmm. dialogue, which is often absent from family. In family, in biological yeah, oh, family, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it almost biological family becomes a means to avoid actually talking about things that we need to talk about, as particularly as you become an adult. I wouldn't have a job as a therapist if right. people talk to their family. Right. <laughs> like, that's that's a serious thing. That is a serious thing. No, so, it's, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I guarantee right. that if you get into one of those drug family relationships, not really understanding what it's about, like, and you are, if you are working together and, and playing together, like you soon start to understand that it's a bigger deal and that can end in rupture. It can end in really lasting, lasting mm. bonds that will, that will be of great benefit to your life. I'm, I'm still incredibly close to my two drag mm. kids and they, they give as much to me as I could only hope that I have given to them in terms of friendship and, and support. So yeah, it's, they're very special relationships for me. And I'm curious now what you would think about the term wounded healer. Uh, the term wounded healer, which, when you first asked me to do the podcast, I was like, oh, uh, I'm not sure why this person wants to speak to me, but the term wounded healer really resonated mm. with me because I feel I'm a person who, whilst the work that I do can absolutely be seen to have that impact, I in no way want to uh, give you the impression that I am somehow fixed. <laughs> 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 and any of these things that I describe drag being really good at and that I've seen be really positive for people in their life, that they are in any way resolved in me whatsoever. Because I think human beings are always incomplete projects. Absolutely. Our completion comes only in yes. death, 
right? And I think if you if you try to portray yourself too much as a person who's sorted, oh my God, you're you're either delusion or you're a mm-hmm. liar. So for me, I think empathy and the ability to understand what it is to be hurt, to be wounded, is the foundation of being able to provide support to another human mm. being. Because you you are able to relate to what they are going through. And it's only in being able to relate, uh, you understand the importance then of also listening to their direct experience and not assuming you mm. know everything that they're going through. So I think the idea of sharing in the experience of being wounded is critically important to being able to help. And that's not to say I need to understand everything about Mm -hmm. your experience or have experienced it directly to be Mm -hmm. of use. And I think that's the other thing that we also get hung Mm. up on. The idea that there is something about me that only I understand. And if you don't understand that, you can't help. Mm. Because I also don't think that's a particularly helpful position to take Mm -hmm. either. The idea that a a straight therapist couldn't understand Mm. me, I think is is flawed. Mm -hmm. Because we need to embrace what's different about each other Mm -hmm. and what we may learn from one another, from a person from a different perspective. Well, I tell my Um, clients all the time, I use our differences as a tool because sometimes I'm going to say things that do not resonate with you or that don't make sense to you. And if Mm. you tell me that, or if you tell me I got something wrong, there's so much to be learned Mm. from us negotiating what we missed about what that totally. what the rupture was what the confusion was we learned so much in that that discussion and that kind totally. of comes back to that the original point you were talking about with debate and how how we've lost the ability to yeah. kind of negotiate and instead we're just firing at each other and yeah. i think that's you know understanding that we are not the same and it stops you from looking at yourself oh, yeah. which is so important it stops yeah. you from looking at yourself critically and by that i don't mean negatively mm-hmm. they're two very different mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. looking at yourself critically and being able to go well what is that about me if you have two people who share exactly the same problem and they both don't have a solution like <laughs> like you you're, you're you're not going to go you're not going to go many places mm. you know what i mean like you do you do need to have that productive tension in order to make any progress in the world productive tension i love that you phrase. need productive tension all the best things all the most interesting art all of the best conversations come from a place mm. of productive tension a willingness to mm. be in a position of precariousness together, mm. right? Where you listen and you negotiate and you figure something out together and you learn from what each other each other doesn't know. And I think something like you say links into that idea of the big debate. And so I think around I'm gonna I'm gonna enter like precarious territory now with you. I think this all the time about identity politics and mm-hmm. how a lot of identity politics, particularly for queer people, so particularly around issues of sexuality and gender, they mm-hmm. lean heavily on an idea of biological essentialism. The idea that we are, and I blame Lady Gaga for the song, uh, Born This Way. Born This Way. Whilst mm-hmm. I love Lady Gaga, please don't hate on Lady Gaga <laughs> fans. I'm a huge Lady Gaga fan. But the notion that you're born a particular way has become incredibly foundational in the way that we argue identity. And that's incredibly Mm. problematic. Number one, because we should all be given the right to change. And Mm -hmm. returning to that point, we need to find the voice that says you've done nothing wrong, not the voice that says it's not your fault. But also that essentialist ideas and biological essentialism particularly is no defense against those people who want to kill you. And Can you say that one more time? I want my brain to catch up with that. So about how biological essentialism the notion mm-hmm. that you are born a particular way is yeah. no defense against those who want to kill you. And we only need to look very, you know, we only need to look at 100 years back to understand what I mean by that, in that mm-hmm. eugenics is a thing. It is a right. thing. It is alive. Yeah. It is alive and well, the ideology of eugenics and the, the idea that queerness is a biological trait that should be eradicated. Or a race, you know, racial traits should be eradicated, um, and so mm. I always err toward the voice that says you've done nothing wrong. You've done nothing wrong. How do you feel about you are not wrong? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, so you mean like in a point of view? Uh, just I'm thinking about you. Oh, as in a sense of foundational, you as a being are not wrong. Yeah, you are not wrong. I think... Rather, because when I think of you've done nothing wrong... Yeah. Um... Well, some people, you've probably done something wrong along the way. <laughs> you may have, but I've never. Oh, I've I definitely never. done things that, that <laughs> you know, I would not do again. Shall we say, put it that way? I, I, definitely. <laughs> who, who hasn't? Right. Who am I? Definitely. And, and that's the complexity, right? Yes. But when I think about the phrase, you've done nothing wrong, it mm. still leaves the, the entity mm. inside of you vulnerable maybe or there's something uh, i want to separate the action yeah from the from being. the sense well so i would say the action and the being are inextricably bound but mm. the the sense of who you are happens or occurs at such a distance from the actions by which it was formed right mm -hmm. and repeated and continues to be repeated on people's journeys throughout their life right mm -hmm. so you are not wrong as an entity. I mean, sure, I suppose it's whatever works, but it also sounds like it makes the person a bit static. That's true. But also, I totally get what you're saying, because that's the way people deal with identity in a sense of who they are. So you have to kind of meet them where they are, right? Yeah, I I think for me, what it does is it, it frees, mm. again, it kind of comes back to, to liberation, right? You are not wrong. Some mm. of your actions could be you can do <laughs> wrong actions or or actions that are hurtful, maybe not wrong, let's say mm. hurtful, right? But at the core of you, I like the idea of you are not wrong mm. because at the core of you, I like the idea of the core of you being something you can return to. In my heart of hearts... You want a core? Uh, you want a center? In my heart of hearts, I want... I want to know and this kind of comes back to the robots and the villains mm. i want to know that somewhere there is a being that can be freed or negotiated mm. with like i want to know that somewhere underneath all of donald trump's horrible actions and bullshit there's a child that just got given the wrong direction yes and and i think for me mm. as a therapist i have to believe that in order to be able mm. to work with empathy or... I, yeah, yeah, so you also then have to deal with the notion of consequence too, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, yeah. I mean, it's very different from what I'm talking about around sexuality and the idea that, which is very much grounded in the idea of morality being dictated by different kind of ethics, right? So mm -hmm. whether you're determined to be right or wrong, being led by the impact of your actions upon yeah, okay. other human beings rather mm -hmm. than a predetermined moral code like a religion or like mm -hmm. a, a social foible or something like mm -hmm. that, right? So whereas what you're describing is very much people who we know who have done shitty things, yeah. how they find a pathway towards redemption and forgiveness or yeah. how can we come to still embrace them as human beings who operate with good intentions. I think Donald Trump, <laughs> with, I, where, I think like, it's an extreme it a, example, right? And, and I think, it's an extreme so, you know, I think pre-2015, pre 2014, Donald Trump, I think he'd have been a right laugh at a party. Do you know what I mean? And I think he'd be incredibly tolerant around lots of issues in the world. And at that point, you know, and then mm -hmm. it's hard to, it's hard to separate Donald Trump as a person with an incredible political power who did a lot mm -hmm. in the world to diminish the well-being of others, potentially knowingly, but potentially mm -hmm. not, you know, because he's probably not very bright when it comes to the idea of being able to understand other people's worldviews and other kinds of life, because he's, he's lived in an incredibly sheltered, privileged existence. So he probably doesn't understand what it is like to be uh, a different kind of human than he is. How mm -hmm. you find some pure heart. I suppose I don't really believe, because what you're talking about has a an overtone of being, a, or an undertone of being a little bit like the immortal soul, right? Or, yeah, or if okay. you were going to think about it in in a more philosophical or in a psychological term, like Heidegger talks about the God, the Dessa, the idea of the thinking and mm. the thinking and not even thinking because that's almost too layered. 
that which perceives, right? Yeah, okay. That which, which experiences, mm -hmm. you know, what is the core. And is that, that, that core presumably would have no moral inflection, right? So it's not that they wouldn't mm. be right nor wrong. They would mm. be fluidly growing and constantly being shaped by the world around them and their intention in it. Yeah, and maybe that's maybe that's kind of where I think I thought I was going and you just explained it in a better Some people aren't nice people. And that's <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's just and like that's not to say that they're evil people. Some people are genuinely not interested in compassion. And that's sometimes difficult when you encounter a person like that. It's very it's tricky because like you, I, I want to believe that people want to err towards rationality and care and empathy and lifting each other up. But this world shapes people mm. and the world we live in, it shapes the very way people think and perceive reality. And that sometimes creates people who are shaped to survive in this reality. And mm -hmm. often those who survive best in this reality don't always have other people's interests at heart. Have you read Gabor Mate's book, The Myth of Normal? Uh, no, but I've read In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. It's his most recent book, and what he kind of talks about is the system isn't designed for us to succeed as mm. human beings are designed to exist. And that's kind of what you just mm. said made me think of. The system has created a world in which some people mm. are naturally just not going to be able to have compassion because they don't have the space for it or they just yeah. haven't been built for and it. These, and the modes of technology that the way we communicate with one another are being forced mm. into, which are always commodified in one way mm -hmm. or another, they, they don't lend themselves to encouraging that to change anytime soon. Mm, I agree with that. So I would actually love to continue talking to you for hours <laughs> because I feel I, I feel like I'm taking a very incredible uni lecture right now, and you should consider creating your own lecture series <laughs> or becoming a professor. Because I, honestly, I I'm just Thanks. I'm really enjoying. You know, I thought I thought about lecturing or I thought about like trying to do, but I th I think sometimes I don't know whether there's a specific subject or something that the things that interest me would fit into. So I'm thinking maybe spiritual leader. Maybe that's where I should aim myself. Do you know what I mean? Go into that kind of try and be like I don't, I, yeah, the next next Jesus Christ, right? That well, kind there's of a thing. documentary on Netflix right now called "How to Become a Cult Leader" that oh, can perfect. point you in the right direction. <laughs> perfect, perfect. That's what I'm aiming for. You know, Doctor Savior Cheddar Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you, I, I am far too white to ever want that particular label <laughs> i and seriously I, I i we had a conversation around climate change recently because i did i did this i rejected a nomination for an award mm. and i got like i got astronomical praise for it mm. and it was one of those weird i felt so awkward about the praise because if you looked oh i think i read about this yeah actually. and yeah. so and it was reported about in the press and like if you look like six posts back on my instagram there is a promotion of an airline right mm -hmm. so like and the point that I'm trying to make around that is that I am no saint. Mm -hmm. Like, I am no angel. I am just as bound as everybody else is in this world mm -hmm. to things that make me feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. sometimes. The things that we, we have to be enmeshed with in order to survive and thrive as human beings, individuals, but also as a species, right? So there's elements of things that we're getting done still. We're not quite there with renewable energy. Mm. We, you know, we're going to be dependent on fossil fuels for a little bit longer. And the human race is wound into that. And I think until you embrace the complexity that none of us are perfect, that we are all imperfect beings, mm -hmm. And that we have to struggle through that and help one another through that imperfection, which sometimes involves radical moments of confrontation and sometimes radical moments of forgiveness and compassion. Mm. Until we get to that level of complex thinking, well, yeah, we're 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 stuck, mm. and we're very stuck at the moment on the idea that you have to be perfect in every possible mm -hmm. way, and it paralyzes you. And the result of that paralysis is it is a complete in action and not moving forward on the things that we have to move forward on. And so mm -hmm. I got I got called out eventually by somebody for that. 
mm-hmm. for the thing. And, and it was this, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't an environmentalist that was calling me out. It was somebody that wanted to diminish my gesture towards helping an environmental cause. And so ultimately mm. our, our desires to be perfect only end up reinforcing that which will not allow us or the world to change. So I know I said I was going to end this, but I'm, can Sorry. I ask you one more question? Yeah, go I'm, for it. How know. do you embrace that duality as a public figure? Honesty and transparency. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, on, and trying to say it when you can. I think honesty is the, is the key. Mm. I think honesty is the most underrated virtue. Mm. It's the only one that we really have to offer because everything else is a little bit of a delusion we spin ourselves. If you can be honest in a way that makes you precarious, which I hope to have done in this conversation Mm -hmm. in terms of my opinions that I think people will disagree with and in terms of that which diminishes my own perceived legitimacy to speak upon things, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where we have to head. If we all start being honest about that stuff, it allows us to be a bit more forgiving of other people as well. We don't have to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if that kind of outlook allows you to have less stress when you act in a public oh, yeah. forum. Because it means when people come, and you've, you've actually seen like the way I engage with people who disagree with me online, mm. that it comes from that place. Mm-hmm. It comes from that thing of like knowing that <laughs> I've said, I'm, have I said no? Probably not. I'm not old. I'm not, I'm not young enough to have said terrible things online, right? <laughs> but I know, yeah. I know that I have said shitty things. Sure. And had shitty opinions. Yeah. I know that I have done that, particularly when I was younger. But, you know, not only when I was younger. Yeah, I think that the permanence of comments and threads and whatnot yeah. does does kind of increase this, like, I have to I have to be perfect all the time. And all contributes to that. I'm, I'm only a couple years younger than you, so we are the last people who, yeah. <laughs> whose dumb, youthful comments and, like, yeah. uninformed stuff does not exist out there no. forever. And so I think that it's important for, as you've said, for the people who who have that memory <laughs> yeah. to, to have compassion for the people who, you know, in 10 years won't have yeah. thought about the fact that their comments will have existed forever. And, you know, I think the other really critically important thing for all human beings is existential crisis. And um, I mean that because <laughs> I think it's a really productive thing to go through if you can come out at the other end, right? Yeah, I agree with that. So to go yeah. through that process of understanding that the way you see and understand the world is is a product of the the way the world has shaped you, right? Yeah. And it means yeah. accepting that all that is foundational about us is, is potentially a construction, right? But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have use. Yeah. And that's the key to coming through the other end of an existential crisis, right? Is understanding that everything's construction and so therefore we're able to embrace our our very experience of reality as something that we can have a hand in shaping. And hopefully to mm. the betterment of ourselves and the people that we are in relationship with, in whatever way that mm. might be. So that that's my hope for existential crisis. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes the other way out of an existential crisis is nihilism, the feeling that nothing matters, right? And that's not productive mm-hmm. either. That's not helpful either, at least no, not on a mass no, no. scale. But in terms of being able to embrace that the world is something you can have a hand in and that you're not hopeless in, and that's something that I, I often worry about with with younger people. So my, my boyfriend's younger than me and he's Gen Z and like a very he's an older mm-hmm. Gen Z. So it's it's not quite, you know, as mm-hmm. uh, bad as it sounds. But the uh, so he's he's in his 20s. He's 24 and mm. 25 now, probably by the time this goes out. And we <laughs> happy birthday we talk to, your, a lot. to your boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah, I just had my birthday too. Oh, I did but, too. Um, when was yours? Yeah, 22nd. Oh, mine's the 24th. Woo! Hey! July birthdays. July babies. Continues. Yeah. And um yeah, so one of my one of my real fears about the generation that is that is had all of their sociality mm-hmm. online. So their connections are mediated by companies whose intention is to sell their attention as ad space, ah, right? Ah, yeah. So mm. all of their behaviour and their opinions is formulated through that. I'm not saying that, that their opinions are wrong because of that. I'm saying that it has all come through this lens of amplification and commodification and polarisation, right? So, mm-hmm. And there is an incredible sense of hopelessness for young people now because they don't see a mm. way out of the quite 
and I don't use this word lightly, totalitarian system that their attention is bound by. Like it is an all encompassing yeah. from every side of their life. It's not a singular system, but it's its effect is a singular trap. The idea that, you know, and it's, it's not just one company. It's not just mm -hmm. one nation. It's not just one dictator. This is a, a noose and a net that is made up of multiple threads and strands and corporations. And it's something I see this more. I actually work a lot with younger clients and I'm getting more and more people coming to me with social media anxiety, people who 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 actually cannot tell the difference between something that's being sort of fed to them and something that's kind of naturally struck their brain because there's no template to help people navigate that Weird. because they're being taught by you and me and we didn't grow up with it so how can we teach you know these kids to to navigate it as they're growing up and we are going to look back upon this age as the most severe dereliction of duty towards the next generation and we're going to see it as worse than cigarettes mm. we're going to see it as worse than alcohol and we're going to recognize that we completely, like the older generation who were meant to be making laws to regulate mm -hmm. this stuff, totally just surrendered mm -hmm. an entire generation of people to a highly addictive and quite not malicious in intent, but a certainly a malignant effect of that, that weird pulling of young people's attention for, for gain, mm -hmm. for the gain of a few people in Silicon Valley and other other social media companies and i think we're going to look back on that and realize that it and this isn't about so people whenever they talk about social media because people are talking about the harmful nature of social media mm -hmm. but they're talking about content and so whilst content is one thing there's a reason why i'm not on tiktok and so i've got a couple of managers who've tried to get me on tiktok and they say no 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 you can do good things with tiktok you can you can tell good stories you can create in a very small amount of time like a really positive message for people on tiktok and you're absolutely right and i'm not mm -hmm. getting down on all the amazing wonderful tiktok influence out there who put nice messages into the world but the very formats are designed to play into your limbic system yeah. to play into the way that our brains are motivated and that is going to be looked upon by history as devastating. Yeah, that's I'm with you on that actually. It's one of the reasons I haven't joined TikTok as well. Also, I feel yeah. too old for TikTok. I don't know, but It's a good thing. But I'm trying to protect yeah, I'm trying to protect my my limbic system, my attention span, the way that I take in information and yeah, in general not just my limbic system, my nervous system, the whole, the whole. It's all connected. It's all connected. And it's all connected. And Gabor's book is great at, at helping to articulate the science in that. That book, all of his books are so good at, at kind of talking about mm. the way that all of that connects. And I could go down a whole route. We'll be sitting here for another five hours if we go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but um... <laughs> let's do it on Twitch. <laughs> Anyways, I do want to be respectful of your time. And so after all of the, the deep thoughts that we have thunk and all of the deep conversations mm. we've had, I do have to ask you, mm. Cheddar Gorgeous. Of course. Are you Team Cheese Toasty or Team Grilled Cheese? Do you know what? When I'm in England, mm -hmm. I am Team Grilled Cheese. And when I'm in America, I'm Team Cheese Toasty. And the reason for that is because I like to feel special wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you now, I've gotten more than one free coffee because of this accent when I'm in the States. So I think I anything that I can do to emphasize my Englishness to an American person charging me for melted cheese, I think the better. Yeah. You know, so I shall use cheese toasty. The more Dick Van Dyke you can go. Hello there, Gabla. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Hello, Mary Poppins. Hello, yeah. Mary Poppins. It's. Uh, I was shocked and appalled when I moved here to find out that not everybody talks like Dick Van Dyke. So I know. Well, the irony is I, I don't talk. Drag for me is also a class play, right? True. So I grew up in Birmingham and I'm from a really quite, quite a modest Birmingham background. My dad was a factory worker and my mom was a checkout girl until she became mm. a nurse. 
when we were a little bit older teenagers. And so I'm quite from quite humble beginnings, mm. really. But I I love playing with a, a sort of well-received English voice. And I especially love it when I'm in America because Americans love it. Oh. And I, I love I love that kind of pleasing people. I love that if we all we all get something from it, I get a little bit of regard. Like I love that stuff, you know? I was actually gonna ask you about your accent because it's I cannot for the life of me understand people from Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> you're not Baba, I'm and your act. I'm your darling, your daughter, yeah? Yeah, those aren't words. That's yeah. not English to me. I mean, yeah. I, it's... No, it's just mostly vowels strung together. Yeah. And yeah, and then you couple in words that I've never heard in my life and then then we're just... Yeah, we're... Aitar. Yeah. Oh, Aitar. It means, isn't it? Yes. No. <laughs> Aitar. Oh, Aitar, yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Because R is yes. When you say O oh, R, O oh, R, that means yes. I've never yes. heard this. And A it means, isn't it? I don't know I, um, how that even works. I can't figure out the dialect and how it works. I don't know anybody else. It's the just, it's it's magic. Yeah. We speak different languages, <laughs> even though we do not. Like orcas. All right. So Cheddar Gorgeous, thank you so much for being a, pleasure. a guest today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Me too. Me too. Thanks to our guest for an amazing conversation today. To find out more about today's guest, you can visit www.headheartbiztherapy.com slash podcast. You can find Sarah at, at Head Heart Biz Therapy on Facebook and Instagram. And you can find Anne at at Spare Room Wellness or spareroomwellness.com. Thanks as always to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>